Hi everybody, Dr. Alice here. In this short video, we're going to talk about the way that neurons translate messages to figure out either how strong they are or what they mean. And we're also going to talk about how neurons can or cannot repair themselves when they're damaged. When we talked about the relative refractory period, we said that neurons can receive signals that are strong in the relative refractory period. Here's the deal with calling a signal strong. All of the messages that neurons send to each other, each of our neurotransmitters all always have the same effect on a neuron, the same small little effect by themselves. So if I'm gonna perceive something as strong or high intensity, there's two ways that I have to do this. The first way would be I need to activate a single neuron many times. So when we, for example, hold something that's very light, like a pencil, that puts a gentle amount of pressure on the neurons in our fingers. As that neuron detects that gentle pressure, it'll send a few little messages to the brain, and those little messages tell the brain, oh yeah, this isn't that heavy, no big deal. But if we're holding something heavy, like a bowling ball, that's continually sending messages to our brain by sending so many messages to our brain, we detect that as a strong stimulus, or we detect that as something heavy. So the first way we can detect a stimulus as strong is if a neuron is sending a bunch of messages with it, we will know that that is a big, powerful sensation that it's detecting. The other way that we can detect something as a strong stimulus is if lots of different neurons are all detecting it. So to go back to our analogy, when you're holding that pencil, there's just a few neurons in your finger that are detecting the weight of that pencil. If we traded out that pencil, again, for a bowling ball, or even just for a rock, more neurons in your hand would be detecting the pressure of that heavy thing. And as more neurons detect that, your brain realizes, oh, this is something that's putting more pressure on me. So if we want to have a strong detection of a stimulus, whether it's pressure, <clears throat> whether it's temperature, whatever it is, either I need to send that message many, many times, or many different neurons need to send that message to my brain. Some of the information that we detect in our body, whether it's strong or weak, is going to undergo something called serial processing. And when we talk about serial processing of information, uh, think of this kind of like an assembly line. So one neuron detects something and sends a message to another, which sends a message to another. We, we go down the line. The end result is always the same. Let's, let's underline, highlight, star that. It's always the same. And see, when we talk about serial processing, the best example of this in your body is reflexes. Every time your body detects that your patellar tendon is being stretched, you will always kick your doctor. That's just what happens. So we'll talk more about reflexes, but these are automatic responses where we always do the same thing. That's because we have a set of neurons that go in order processing that information, leading to a set outcome. But other kinds of information, in fact, probably most of the information you detect, actually undergoes what's called parallel processing. And when we talk about parallel processing, one sensation actually triggers uh, a, a variety of different processing pathways in your brain at the same time. With parallel processing, your responses can vary compared to my responses. So for example, uh, when I smell a pickle, I might think, hmm, that sounds yummy, let's do it. You might think, pickles, disgusting. Or when I smell bacon, I might think breakfast. You might think bacon cheeseburger. But depending on the time of day, you might also think breakfast. Or you might also think, no thank you, not for me. Parallel processing individualizes things a little bit more. Multiple different pathways pull in memories, pull in other sensations to process that information. So serial processing, very predictable. 
like our reflexes, most of your processing is parallel processing. We, we bring in information from multiple different directions. This brings us to the idea of neuron circuits. And neuron circuits are the various ways that neurons communicate with each other to do different tasks, to do some of that parallel processing or to get things done. So let's go through one by one with these circuits. Make sure that you can identify them in pictures and make sure you know what they're helpful for. So the first kind of circuit that we see here on the left is called a diverging circuit. In a diverging circuit, one neuron stimulates a couple other neurons, which stimulate a couple other neurons. My signal goes very quickly from one neuron to many different neurons. Diverging circuits are really good for things like making skeletal muscle movements happen. One neuron in your brain talks to multiple neurons in your spinal cord, which talks to even more neurons in your muscles, making your muscles get activated. So if I want a signal to be amplified or to be made louder, to have a bigger effect, I use a diverging circuit. The opposite of a diverging circuit is a converging circuit. In a converging circuit, multiple different neurons are collecting information and funneling it together into a single neuron. A good example of a converging circuit is what we were talking about with smelling food. Multiple different sensations all come in together leading to remembering a single memory. So whether it's the smell of perfume, it's the texture of a particular piece of clothing, it's the weather outside, all of those feed in together to help you remember the same thing, that one really awesome date that you had. So multiple kinds of stimuli lead to the same memory. That's a converging circuit. We also use what are called reverberating circuits. And reverberating circuits are what are really important for things that constantly happen in your body. So for example, the process of breathing, which is always occurring to keep you alive, we send the initial signal from the brain stem to contract our muscles or to keep the breathing process going. But as we get to the end of this circuit, we actually send that message back up and re-stimulate it and re-stimulate it over and over again to make sure that it doesn't end. This is also the way that, that I do something like walking without looking funny. All of the different muscles that have to contract at the right time know what to do because of reverberating circuits. The final kind of circuit is called parallel after discharge circuits. In a parallel after discharge circuit, multiple different circuits of neurons are all processing a stimulus at the same time. That's what parallel means. All of these different circuits process it and end up coming up with a single output that comes out of this. Now, just like a parallel after discharge circuit looks very complex, this is the kind of thing that I use to do complex processing. For example, like math. So next time you're working on a math problem and you just can't get to the answer, you can just tell your teacher it's the parallel after discharge circuits. They're just not working for you. They're not running parallel. We can't do this exacting mental process, something like math. One other thing to mention with our neurons is whether or not neurons can change or repair themselves. The nervous system is amazing in its ability to do what's called neuroplasticity. Neuroplasticity is the ability of your, your nervous system to adapt to what's going on around you. We are constantly changing the structure of our brain every time we learn things or every time we make memories. So when you learn, you're actually creating synapses or creating uh, scenarios where neurons can talk to each other, uh, rewiring the direction of your brain. When we talk about ner nervous system damage, <clears throat> we mentioned this a little bit before, in the central nervous system, we cannot really repair damage to our neurons. 
there are three reasons for this. Reason number one, like we talked about, is that the, the, the type of cells that make the myelin sheath around neurons in the central nervous system, the oligodendrocytes, actually prevent the process of repairing neurons. Another problem in the central nervous system, though, is that we're not using growth cues. We're never telling the neurons there, or the cells there, to grow because that part of your body is developed by about age 25. So we stop sending messages that would help the cells to repair themselves. The other problem, though, is those type of, of helper cells called astrocytes, the ones that made the blood-brain barrier and maintained the environment up there, they're really good at dividing as well. So when we have damage to various locations in the brain, what will form instead of new nervous tissue is scar tissue with astrocytes. So we fill in empty spaces with helper cells and we can't repair with neurons. This is different though, remember, in the peripheral nervous system, because I use those Schwann cells, Schwann cells allow me to be able to repair. So for example, I have a neuron with multiple Schwann cells that are attached to its axon. We have a lesion or we have damage at this site. When this site gets damaged, the nearby Schwann cells will eat away the damaged parts and help support the part that's still functional to generate new, new dendrite or new um, axon terminals. Over time, we might reform that axon that was once damaged because we have the Schwann cells there to guide it. So Schwann cells allow us to repair in the peripheral nervous system where oligodendrocytes say that we cannot repair. An important difference between the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system.